It's great to have everyone, if you're joining us via the internet, we encourage you to worship with us. I do want to remind you that immediately following these services that we will have the monthly men's meetings, and then after that we will eat downstairs, and then we will be going to, uh, to carry on with our door uh, uh, tags. Uh, I'm not going to mention all those who are sick. I do want to mention uh, Alexis and Kimmy. Both of them uh, are waiting for results of their tests, and we just want to make sure that everything uh, has, uh, that everything is good uh, with them. There's a long list of people who are in need of our prayers, and you might want to look in the bulletin, or if you don't have a bulletin, if you could just listen to the first service. Uh, then we made a long list. In just a moment, Jack will continue leading us, and Kyle will have our Bible reading and prayer. Good morning. Uh, 233 will be the opening song. 233, Footprints of Jesus. <clears throat> Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that makes the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where'er they go. If they lead through the temple, holy preaching the word, or in homes of the poor and lowly serving the Lord. Footprints of Jesus that makes the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where'er they go. Then at last when on high he sees us our journey done. We will rest where the steps of Jesus and at his throne. Footprints of Jesus that makes the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where'er they go. 173, 173, count your blessings. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. <clears throat> when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. 
Count so many blessings angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Scripture reading will be uh, Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. While the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Would you follow me, please? Dear our Father, we come to you once again. Uh, we're able to uh, worship you in the in spirit and in truth. Uh, we ask you to be with Kimmy and Alexis, be with Norman, Sister Kitty, be with Norman Dolan. Please be with... Um, uh, baby Nash, Baby Haley, Baby uh, Kaida, Baby Eliana, uh, please be with um, uh, with the door tags and, and those who are doing the Bible correspondence and uh, studying to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would, mark the song invitation, it'll be 465. 465, are you washed in the blood? And before the lesson, we'll sing 170, 170, a shelter in the time of storm. <clears throat> The Lord our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in the weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in the weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. O oh, rock divine, O oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. O oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. O oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. I want to read uh, in our lesson text this morning for this lesson will be Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the servant, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit uh, of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God know that, know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree, that it was good for food, it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made of themselves uh, aprons. 
When one begins to uh, contemplate uh, the idea of sin and uh, temptation, uh, one is kind of immediately confronted with certain complexities. Um, and we are, we are also confronted uh, with dilemmic things in our minds that, um, that we sometimes use to mitigate sin, by which I mean, you know, we think, well, you know, we're in the world, the world has all these temptations, the devil's so active, and all these things are happening. But I think it's very important to remember that in the Garden of Eden, where Eve and Adam were at that time, there was zero sin, not one sin. In heaven, there was no sin. Now, the common denominator in both of those equations would be the devil, who tempted Eve and, and the devil who led the rebellion uh, that uh, caused a, myri a myriad of angels to uh, follow in him, with him. Uh, however, uh, if one were to argue that, well, I mean, the, you know, the environment and all would be causal, uh, then that would, that, that would be an invalid uh, argument because what environment was there in heaven that would have been causal? What environment was there in the Garden of Eden that was really typical of heaven, like heaven? Uh, in fact, so typical, in fact, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, I mean, the, not that, but the tree of life, is now in heaven with God. So there's nothing causal that is associated with, with those things. Now, so when you begin to look at sin and the unfolding of sin and the scheme of redemption and everything that is involved in it, it is uh, a curious discovery uh, for example, in uh, chapter 8 of Genesis, uh, the flood is over and Noah uh, does an altar and he offers a sacrifice to God and God said it was a sweet savor and that tells you that God accepted the sacrifice. And then the text says that God in his heart, in his heart, and we were, by revelation, we were we were uh, able we we're able to know what God said in His heart, and undoubtedly, this is something that would have been said in the hearts of all three members of Godhead. And what they said is, "We're not going to destroy the world anymore. There will be no cleansing, world cleansing anymore." Uh, and then the reason is given because humans, in their heart and all, they're just evil. They're just they're going to commit sin. So the way to deal with sin is not by cleansing in the sense that it occurred in the noetic event. That won't work. In fact, it won't be long until after the flood that Noah himself will get drunk. And then other sin will come from that. So if the solution is to so cleanse everything that it solves the problem of sin, then uh, there's no answer there at all because you have the utopia of heaven and the utopia of the Garden of Eden. It didn't work then. And then you have the cleansing and the restarting. The world is like restarted, not in totality, but as, as, as it relates to the globe, to this earth uh, itself, uh, uh, it, is, uh, it, it, is re, it is redone. So, so that's not going to work, and God's not going to do that anymore. So the answer is not this universal cleansing by destruction. It is salvation. Salvation is the answer. Why? Because humans are going to sin. That's just the way it is. And things cannot be so clean and so perfect that they won't sin. It just ain't going to work that way. So there's got to be another solution, and that other solution has got to be the salvation of the human race. Now, if you play on the ball field of the devil, uh, you're into a lose-lose situation. The devil counts on the sin, on sin its consequences. And if it's tit for tat, you don't really have, you don't have much hope. So what did God do? God sent his only begotten son who voluntarily came and, and, and lived under a law system, sinless, 
and died for the sins of the world to do something that would cut the throat of the devil forever and destroy evil forever. He created a situation whereby sin that humans were going to commit would be forgiven and taken away as if they had never happened. That's such an unbelievable thing. Now, underlying all of that is a whole other subject matter that I hope to address pretty soon in a sermon, and that is the discovery of, is that on the part of God uh, as it relates to matters of free choice and the whole matter, which is an entirely different matter, but it's also important. So having said all of that, I am now curious as to what happened in the Eve event. Uh, because here we have the first temptation of the, uh, of the human race, uh, and it is conducted by the devil, who himself is a fallen angel. And who him, so, so in heaven, there is no physicality. Uh, people are not physical, they're spirits. So the things that we think of as being tempting to us, we most often associate with physicality, which is not an accurate, a totally accurate view of it. Because the thing that did the devil and his angels uh, in was not physicality at all. It was pride. Pride transcends physicality. You cannot even have physicality and have pride. And that's what did, and that's what did, uh, you know, uh, the devil and the angels that followed him uh, in, because they, you know, we learned that in the qualification of elders, he was lifted up with pride, the brightness, the beauty. He's obviously beautiful, whatever that means. Uh, he was beautiful, and that, and that beauty alone was an enticement to the other uh, angels. Isn't that interesting? I mean, when you begin to look at all that is involved in it. However, when you look at the Genesis 3 account and the temptation, uh, it is a, a miniature textbook on how temptation works. And so I want to take a few moments in, in just a very simple way you know, I, the things I've been talking about so far uh, are not simple. They're, they they involve some real complexity. So now I want to I want to change the dial and I want to look at just simple stuff. What is it that did Eve in? The first mistake that she made is she listened, and and she listened to someone other than God. Now, there are no other humans in the uh, Garden of Eden uh, narrative to listen to. She didn't listen to uh, her, her mother or her aunt or her children. There's just, there is she and her husband. And then there's God, of course. And they had already been communicating with God. So who else is there to listen to? Now there is another party. And it is also very possible that they had even communicated uh, with the devil, who was not the devil at that point, because when you look in the prophecies, you learn that the devil, before he was the devil, was actually in the Garden of Eden with God, at least at times. So the devil comes in a disguise, in a way that, devil, that, that Eve would not recognize him. And... And this snake, this serpent, speaks to her. Uh, was that a common event? Did a snake speak? And the, I, I think we would just say absolutely not. This was an extraordinary event. But everything is new and everything is different. And maybe it's just another matter of something unusual to discover for Adam and Eve and and she seems not to have been taken back by the fact that a, that, a, that a snake is talking to her. For whatever reason, that does not seem to be a big issue to her. 
And then she listens to what he says. And the devil does not have a lot to say. He does not have a lot to say. And, uh, you know, the Bible uh, offers this, uh, this admonition in Mark 4, verse 24. He said unto them, Take heed what you hear, and what, because with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you, and to, unto you, and to you that hear shall more be given. And here we have a, a uh, and you know, the take heed is, uh, it's, the Greek word is blepa, and it means examine. You examine what you hear. Now that is a command that, that everybody must follow. Christians must follow. We must be careful what we listen to. And uh, some things we ought not listen to at all. Uh, some things we should give no attention to at all. But her first mistake was that she listened to not only the wrong person, but to the wrong thing. We also learn in Luke 8, verse 18, that we are to take heed how we hear. We not only take heed to what we hear, but how we hear. And that tells me that there is a right and a wrong way to hear things, that, uh, that we can hear things in a way that would set us up for a fall. For example, what if we have already prepared our hearing for a lie? What if there are certain things we want to hear, we want to believe that are not even reality? So if somebody comes and tells you something that you already want to believe, you're more likely to actually believe it. So what does God want us to do? He wants us to love truth and, and to demand truth and uphold truth and listen to truth and have the discrimination to not listen when we shouldn't. So the very first mistake that she made was she listened, she paid attention. Now, have you ever thought about all of our lives? Our lives are like a myriad of things happening in a single day. Uh, in fact, there's so much happening that we really give very little credence to what's going on. If you drive down the road, you see this, you see that, you hear this, you hear that. And unless it's something extraordinary, it's pretty mundane. You know, if you're driving down the road and you, and you meet 100 uh, vehicles, you probably don't pay much attention to it unless one of them tries to run into you or nearly run you off the road. It's part of the mundanity of, of life. And there's so many things that we hear. You know, you can be going down the road and turn the radio on, and you hear this and you hear that. Just in normal conversation, here and there, always things that we hear. But there are, there, there's more than one way to hear. You can kind of hear and not hear. But once you get into the business of listening, that means you're paying attention. So here comes this snake that's talking and not hissing, though, though he might have, the snake might have been hissing because the Hebrew word there is hisser, but he, the snake is <clears throat> talking. So, <clears throat> so what is happening here is she is listening to the devil undermine God. I am not totally sure that she even was was fully uh, that she fully comprehended what was happening and in all likelihood she may not have she's hearing something new now she's listening to it it pops in her mind like it would pop in my in, in our minds and now she's now she listen very carefully she has one look of God she trusts God she loves God she believes in God <clears throat> and listen to this that quick, the devil makes her doubt God. That is terrifying to me. You ever known people in your life and you, uh, you know what kind of people they are and you believe in them and you trust in them and then somebody comes and tells you something bad about them <clears throat> and the next thing you know, you believe it. And it might not even be true. It may be a, it may be a lie. And so instead of all the years of the belief that you had in them, it's like it doesn't take but just a little bit to, to totally turn on them and to totally disbelieve them. But this is, we don't know, I mean, this was a very quick event that was happening. We don't know how long 
Uh, it happened after Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. It could have been quite a while. We just don't know. But at some point, this serpent comes and talks, <clears throat> and she listens. Then the second thing she did is she responded. She looked. <clears throat> and, you know, the in Proverbs 6, verse 27, Solomon asked this question, <clears throat> can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? <clears throat> and the answer is no. If we, if we stop and we listen and we look, then it's going to have an effect on us. <clears throat> David looked at Bathsheba when he should have turned his head and looked at the horrible consequences. Eve looked and uh, looked and look and see what happened. Therefore, when things occur to us in our lives, and we need to be careful what we listen to, <clears throat> we need to be careful at what we look at, what we're paying attention to. You know, Peter looked at the wind and the waves, and what did he do? He sunk. In 1 John 2, verse 16, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it is of the world. So what John affirms here is that one of the greatest avenues to our hearts is through the lust and the desires that we have. Um, you know, in Matthew 5, verse 28, there's a striking statement uttered. It said that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her committeth adultery with her already in his heart. That would also be true of a woman. <clears throat> what would apply to the man here would be. So that means that a person could commit adultery in their hearts without ever committing adultery in a physical act. And the truth of the matter is, is the uh, act of adultery would probably always begin <clears throat> in a person's heart and then it would be acted out, maybe or maybe not, uh, in the actual act. But the devil now makes her look. And what's fascinating is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is in the middle of the garden. <clears throat> I have no idea in the world how big the garden was. But God put it right there in the middle. It was accessible. But what we learn here is she just didn't really pay any attention to it. Why? God said, don't eat it. So she didn't pay any attention. That was something that God had said. The only thing that God had prohibited, as far as we know. Don't do that. Don't partake of the fruit uh, from the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't do it. And there's no telling how many times Adam and Eve passed that tree, never paid any attention to it. You know what happens in your mind? If you know there's something you just cannot do or something that's dangerous, what do you do? You, we generally don't pay a lot of attention to it. You know, uh, I don't know how many uh, bars that I drive by in my life, but I, don't, I hardly ever pay attention to a bar unless something weird were to happen. You know, somebody might be pulling out of the parking lot and I have to look to not be run over. You know why? Because I'm not going to go in a bar. I'm not going to pay attention to a bar because I'm not going to go into a bar. Why would I care uh, or think about what's going to happen at the bar? But then... The, devil, the time the devil gets us to listen will soon be followed by us looking. Now we're paying attention to things and people that we ought not be paying attention to. And that's how it works. The next thing that happened is logical in a sequential way she desires. You know, notice that John describes the three avenues through which Satan works. And included in this, of course, is the lust of the flesh. Now, James, in James 1, verse 14, says, Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust, his own desires, and then he is baited. And then look at Genesis 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eye, and, it, and, and, and to be desired to make one wise. Don't you listen to this. In this one event, all three avenues of temptation are right there. All three avenues. She's never noticed this thing. Now she looks. She undoubtedly had what was aware that was there and that there was a fruit. Now she looks, and she never thinks about it before, but now this is good. 
You know what? This is good food. That would be really good fruit. And it looks good. It's beautiful. And then here's a real kicker. If you eat this, you'll be wise. Wouldn't it be something if you could just eat a fruit or just eat a nut and then you'd be wise? You wouldn't have to try to be wise. You'd just be wise. And, and so what does she do? Well, once she had listened and looked and then she desires and the next thing she does is she acts. She acts. You know, uh, the word pleasant here, by the way, is from a Hebrew word that literally means a desire. Uh, a desire. She desired it. She, she now, it's not abstracted anymore. Now it is entered enough into her heart and mind that she wants it. Once something comes into our hearts and minds and we want it, then, then the, the, uh, the engine to the train has not only been started, the train is now moving and it's going to engage more and more. Have you ever thought about how we act when we want something? You want something and you might even do research and try to find out about it. And then you go and then we go and we talk to someone else about it. And then we begin to see about the possibility of having it and how much would it cost and then what would it mean and we look at all this stuff. And all that means is that the engine has started and now we're moving and we're moving toward it. It is a hard thing to stop that engine. Once that desire gets going, most people are going to push it to, till they get whatever they're looking for, whatever it may be, big or small. And then, and then as... Step four is she took, she acted on it. And, um, and what, did, <clears throat> what did David do? He looked at a woman. He didn't even know the woman. He desired the woman, found out who she was, and he, and he took her. Uh, because that's the system. That's how it works. You, you look, you, you listen, you, uh, you, you look, uh, you desire, and then you act on it. And that means that the train has arrived at the station. Now, what else happens? Isn't this just a road map to the way we live our lives? I mean, it shouldn't be, but it is. It's how it works. Now, then another thing happens. Now she tempts someone else. Now she tempts someone else. Have you ever asked yourself this question? What did Eve feel the moment that she ate that fruit? Have you ever thought about that? Did she feel guilty? Did she feel like something different had happened to her? I mean, undoubtedly, she knew the difference between uh, good and evil just like that. What I'm trying to tell you, and I don't think this is contemplated, is that whatever happened in the partaking of that fruit happened like that. It's having a big effect on her, like life and death effect. Big stuff happening, just like that. What does she do? She gets her husband. You think she cared about her husband? I, I think so, at least on some level. And she gives him the fruit, and he just, He just took it. You know, I went to, down, down uh, the road where I lived in Tullahoma, Tennessee, there was a family that lived on the end of the road, and they were members of the congregation uh, where I attended. So when I went to Lipscomb, <clears throat> this boy, who was younger, he went maybe a year or so later, maybe two years later, I'm a little bit unclear, but, but I, I was, uh, you know, talking to him one day, and and, uh, you know, we had been home, and, and my dad was going to take me back, because uh, I didn't even have a car back then. He was going to take me back to college. And I said to him, I said, look, you know, you're welcome to ride with me. And he says, no, I, I'm, I can't do that. I'm going to go with my dad. 
And I said, well, okay, that'd be fun. He said, well, I mean, you know, we always go downtown to, the, to look at the porno houses, the pornography houses. Now, his dad was allegedly a Christian. He, he, he has taken his son to watch pornography. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. What kind of father would corrupt their son? You talk to, you, you, you know, you have Edgar Allan Poe, and, he, and alcoholism was the reason for his premature death. You know where he learned to drink? At his own father's table. So what do people do? Well, they hardly ever are in sin alone. They always want somebody else to be in it with them. You know, uh, you know here are the Pharisees, and uh, you know, they, are, they are over here trying to uh, tempt the Son of God. And, and when we are tempting someone else, we now become uh, like a devil ourselves. We become an instrument in the hands of the devil, and the devil knows that. People know that people, the devil knows that people are rarely in sin alone. They almost always involve someone else on some level. And sometimes in ways that people don't even think about. It's like a woman who is married to uh, an alcoholic, and she herself would not dare take a drink of alcohol, but she is an enabler. And she goes to the store and she buys the alcohol for him. And she thinks that, you know, she doesn't drink it. She's not an alcoholic. And she is being sweet and kind to her husband. She's giving him the very thing that will eventually kill him. And, and most time it will. She's an enabler. She would be just as accountable to God as if she were an alcoholic. So how, how, could, how could a person have the right kind of mind that thinks... Well, I'm aiding and abetting uh, someone here, but that's okay. I mean, I'm not doing it, and I love them, and, and, and my husband or my wife, they don't, they don't like to go out to the liquor store. I'll get it for them. I'll save it for them. And that's the way humans think. Then what did she do? She hid. You know, first of all, no one can hide from God. David, of course, uh, tried to do it in his way, and we know that Achan stole of the accursed things, thinking that he would not be discovered, and it ended up not only in his destruction, but the destruction of every member of his family. So by this time, which would have been instantaneous, the full import of what Adam and Eve did had now crushed down upon them. And now, now don't you get this straight. This is a husband and wife. And they, are, they, are, they don't have to get naked. They're already naked. But now they want to put clothes on because they are ashamed of being naked. Isn't that a fascinating thing? Well, what's happened? Well, good and evil and things like shame and all that kind of stuff that goes with it, they've got it in a single dose, just a single bite. Bang, here comes the atomic bomb of it, and it hits them. Now, now they're, they're taking matters in their own. They're going to make clothes for themselves. And really what, uh, by the way, if you ever want a discussion about modesty, you might want to read or understand what Adam and Eve, they, they made these little scarce coverings, and then God comes along with a kutaneth. He's going to cover them up. You know, if you want a lesson on what's modest and immodest, uh, the solution they, that they have for modesty is not the one that God wants. God's going to cover them up. But now they are ashamed. They are ashamed of themselves. They are ashamed of themselves. They are covering themselves. They're trying to hide from God. And that's what people do. They try to cover it up. David was willing to cover his sin up at the murder of an innocent human being, an innocent man. And then what happened finally? Well, Eve said, well, the devil made me do it. The devil beguiled me. And then what did Adam say? Well, the woman gave me the fruit. They blamed someone else. Is it true that the devil beguiled Eve? Absolutely. Was that an excuse? No. Is it true that Eve uh, gave the fruit to her husband? That's true. But was that an excuse? No. 
Have you ever thought about the meaning of the word excuse? It's like if, if we're going to be excused, we're going to be permitted to not do something. In other words, it's like it's okay. It's okay. It's okay that you failed. You know, here's an excuse. And here's, I'm going to give you a written excuse and you can miss class or you can miss a day of school or whatever. So once people are in the business of excuse making, then they are not in the business of what we talked about when this lesson began, salvation. Jesus came to save the world. He came to save you and me. He offered his unspotted, pure blood without sin or blemish for the sins of the entire world. And if humans will hear the word of God, believe it, repent, confess, and be baptized, they can enter a safe condition, have all past sins remitted, and live a faithful Christian life. And even as faithful Christian lives, we still have the problem of sin, and yet God will instantly forgive our sins as Christians as we repent and confess those sins. That is the ultimate solution. But when we listen and look and desire and act, and then tempt someone else, and then try to hide from God and blame others for our sins. We're in the wrong business. We are doing the very thing that led to the fall of Adam and Eve and that led to the fall of the human race. And it's such a simple matter, isn't it? So I want to end by asking you this question. There are seven steps here. At what point do you think the process ought to stop in the seven-step process? What, what step would you stop it? What about step number one? Number one. We need to protect our hearts and our minds because who knows what can happen. Years ago, I knew a, a woman and a man that remembers the church, uh, and uh, I don't remember now exactly what type of, I, I, don't, I don't think I, I'd have to think about it, but right now I don't remember what type of work she did, but, but she worked in an office, and, um, and she and her husband, they were very faithful Christians, they, you know, uh, hard workers and everything, and it wasn't too long they got a divorce. And the reason he got a divorce is because uh, uh, this, this man's wife had committed adultery with like two or three different men. And later on, you know, she came and talked to me about it, and I, I pointed her to what she needed to do to be right with God. But she told me something really fascinating. She said, you know, I went to work, and I'm, I'm just kind of a plain Jane girl. And all of a sudden, these guys in the office, they began to compliment me. They were just little compliments. And I just never really thought of myself in these terms. I never thought of myself as being pretty or desirable on some level. And, and I really listened to all that stuff. And it, and it, it really bothered me because I, I really couldn't even think of a time to where my husband would, even, would ever tell me about how pretty I am and desirable and all that. And I don't mean by that that he ever mistreated me. It's just that, but these, these guys were all telling me this, and it never crossed my mind that, you know, they were, they were wanting to use me. And she said, and once I committed adultery with one of them, it was easy for another one and for another one. That's the way it works. She listened. She listened to the compliments, the motivation of which were, were not good. They were not good. You ever wonder, when somebody compliments you, you ever wonder why they compliment you? I learned something when I was a young preacher. You know, when you're young, you're so stupid about things anyway, but you'd have people come at the worship, come after worship service and, oh, that was a great sermon, and they'd talk about this and that. When I was young, you know, it kind of had an effect on me, and I'd think, oh, well, that's great. And the same people two weeks later would come out and say terrible things to you. And it had a great impact on the way I thought. After that, I let whatever anybody ever said to me be like water off a duck's back. If they were complimentary, fine. And if they were derogatory, fine. 
I made up my mind that what I preached was going to be what pleased God, and I didn't care who liked it, and I still don't care. I don't care who likes it, who dislikes it. All I care about is what God likes and dislikes. Because what if I had listened to that stuff? I know preachers who did. I know preachers who changed their style of preaching to preach the type of sermons that people love and they wanted you to preach this type of sermon because when the sermons are over, everybody felt good and nobody felt challenged or that they needed to do something different. I, th I thank God that in all of the stupidity of my life that I have not lived my life listening to stuff like that because what does it mean? Ultimately, nothing. Nothing. Humans can love you one day and hate you the next. But God, God is different. God is, God is there pulling for us as long as we're doing what he wants us to do. And he will never fail us. He will never betray us. And he will never tell us anything that's a lie. And he will never flatter us, ever. So this woman I told you about a moment ago, you know what her words were? They really flattered me. And I didn't realize that that's all it was. They didn't even mean it. It was just flattery. They were telling me this because there were things they wanted, which I supplied for them. And in the process of it, I lost everything. That's how the devil works, for you and for me. If you're not a Christian, I've told us in this sermon what to do to be saved and stay saved. Won't you come while we stand and sing? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white, pure and white in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansions bright? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed? In the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Does anybody need to partake of the Lord's Supper? If not, please turn to Song 13. Song 13. One, three, for the beauty in the earth. We'll sing the first and the last verse. <clears throat> for the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love right from our birth, over and around us lies. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For Thy church that evermore 
lifted holy hands above, offering up on every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Let us pray. Heavenly and merciful Father, we humbly bow to thee again, thanking you so, so much for another opportunity to sing songs to thee, learn about thee, praise thee and honor thee and worship thee in spirit and truth. We pray that we can hold this time and every time that we have to honor thee near and dear to our hearts, that we can cherish this moment, that we will put our all to thee and give thee our all. We're so grateful for each and every opportunity that we have to gather together to study with like-minded brothers and sisters to, to be able to uh, strengthen and sharpen and edify and lift up each other and to correct and to again move forward in our faith and to grow continually with every day, every day that we're given every breath in our body. We're so thankful for this congregation and we're so thankful for the work of all the members and all the families to put in to stand for truth, to hold fast to truth, to be able to fortify uh, the word and, and to be able to uh, lift thee up on high. We're so thankful for the opportunities to work. We pray that we can continue to work and work harder and that we can put more upon our backs and that we can continue to carry and to, to spread the word, to, to do the work that you have given us to do. We're so thankful to be able to pray for those that are sick and afflicted. We pray for Alexis and Kimmy and the upcoming uh, tests. We pray that you will comfort them and that, again, they can find comfort in, in, uh, in thee. We pray for Norman's sister, uh, Kitty. We pray for Norman himself. We pray for Anthony Gump and his continually, uh, continual recovery and Peggy Walsh. We pray for uh, Laura Cade and her mother. We pray for uh, Joan Fisher and we pray for Denise's uh, son's friend and Ron Fithin and uh, Adam... Uh, Grindel and Sharon Malrick and her mother. We pray for all those that are, again, fighting for their health. We know that life is precious. We know that we are to do whatever we can to, to, to hold near and dear to that, that gift that you've given to us. We pray as we go to do the door hanging and the door uh, tags that you will be with us, keeping us safe, and that, again, we can uh, help to spread the gospel, that we can give people opportunities to know the truth and to help study with them and to bring them to thee. We pray for the food that we are about to eat uh, as the congregation, that you will be with us, that you will nourish our bodies, that you will give us the strength to do what we need to do for the church. We're so thankful. We're so appreciative. And again, words cannot describe all of the, the, the cares and, and opportunities and the thankful. Uh, the, the gratitude and the thankfulness that we are filled with, Lord, we, we pray that we can always put Thee on the forefront of our mind, that we can keep Thee there in, in all the work that we do throughout the week. We pray that we will always put Thee first and we will always be able to thank Thee with every day that we are given and every night that we are given. We pray that uh, You will be with us and that we are so thankful for Your great sacrifice of Your Son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins as we repent of them. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.